We've gone halfway through our sermon series, Discomfort for a Purpose, looking at the, the narrative of Christ's birth. Today we're going to talk about his birth, the shepherds and all that, the discomforts that Mary and Joseph go through, the, the shepherds, and I found it interesting looking at the different, I guess, lots in life, if you will, for the discomfort, Zechariah and Elizabeth, the unknown discomfort of being barren, just kind of being the ridicule of society because they can't have uh, kids, and then finally the Lord uses it, redeems it for a purpose when they're when they're old, Mary and Joseph, very clearly the angel wants them to know why, comes to Mary and Joseph, not just uh, allow or have Joseph rely on what Mary says, but wants them to know exactly what's going on, uh, the reason for all this. And so they're going to trek over to Bethlehem today, and we'll get another side of discomfort. Look at the shepherds. They have a, a life, a lot of calling of discomfort being shepherds working out in the fields all day being uh, religiously ceremoniously unclean but they have their purpose don't they they're they're there to take care of these lambs these passover lambs these sacrificial lambs they have a great purpose for their lives of discomfort i'm not sure if any of you have or do work a difficult job perhaps a dirty job a blue collar job obviously that's tongue in cheek most of you all here in the joyce community you're, you're not sitting in an office in a, a shirt and tie, a beautiful Christmas suit and tie. Most of you are working, getting your hands dirty, aren't you? You're logging, you're uh, fishing, you're uh, in the, the sawmills, the paper mills, doing uh, these sorts of tasks. Kind of God's calling for you in life. It's not an easy vocation. It's a fulfilling one. It's a rewarding one. Uh, you uh, loggers, my understanding, you're not just cutting down trees just for the heck of it. There's a purpose, so that way uh, we can have all sorts of, we can build houses, we can have paper, we can have all sorts of things that we utilize and, and use. There's a purpose for things. Some, some of our purposes in life are more, I guess, spiritually significant, one might say, or, or directly spiritually significant, but we all have callings in our life. What does the Lord want from me? So it might be directly correlated and tied to our our, our, our job in life as a pastor, my job is, on the, is certainly more spiritual uh, than somebody who works with their hands, but that doesn't mean that you can't have great impact. When I was first job out of college working in the glass factory, I had the opportunity to have uh, a wonderful impact on these, uh, these guys, maybe a gal or two, uh, who you want to say, worked with their, their hands working these, the, the, the factory assembly line. And even as a meteorologist, okay, yes, that was my job, that was a career I enjoyed, but uh, what impact, what bright light can I be for the kingdom? So we have purposes in all of our lives. Today we're going to look at discomfort for purpose with Jesus' birth ruby in Luke chapter 2. So the, uh, the, screen, the words will be up there on the screen. I encourage you to follow along with your Bible. Thank you, Dennis, and please uh, thank Carrie from us for having screens that, that work today. Appreciate all that. And so... Hopefully it will be good for another 6,000 hours or so of bulb, of bulb life. So as we jump on in here, I think this will work for us. Brandon, could you do me a favor and just try to click the screen for me? I wonder if maybe my clicker's doing something funky. Did you click next or did I click next? You did, okay. Okay, now I got control. Appreciate it. Thank you, Brandon. So looking at Luke chapter 2, starting here in verse 1, says that in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. That is all the Roman world. Romans obviously don't have authority over different countries, but all their world, all the, this uh, world, that they should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. So we get this this setting, Mary is now pregnant. She's about eight, nine months pregnant when uh, this decree, this declaration comes about for all of Roman world to be counted. And so it continues on, verse 4, it says that Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because 
He was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. So we have this discomfort. It's not comfortable enough. Those who travel from their home, uh, even any childbirth process is not comfortable. That's my understanding. But imagine to have it travel now uh, walking or on donkey back or horseback or whatever mode of transportation they would have had. They now have to go significantly pregnant over to Nazareth, over to this uh, city of David. And so purpose, why go through this discomfort? Why is this you know, not super significant, but there's certain, certainly great, wonderful ties in here. Why go for this trek? Well, it's because the authority said so. We know as followers of Christ, as Christians, as, as men and women of God, if those in authority over us uh, give us instructions and it does not contradict what the word of God, what God's clear instructions say, we are under moral obligation to obey them. I'm sure it would have been easy to play the, try to play the pregnancy card. I'm not going. This is too much of a pain. I'm not doing it. I don't know. I can't imagine that would go over well. Uh, but certainly one would imagine in their mind, I don't want to do this thing. But no, they were to submit to your governing authority. So the purpose, number one, I believe, submit to authority. Kind of a low-level purpose there. But it says Romans chapter 13 tells us, let every person be subject to the governing authority. There's no authority except from God and those who exist have been instituted by God. So we see God's wonderful sovereign hand. We know he sovereignly has his hand over the birth of Jesus and even using this Roman pagan, awful, horrible government to bring about his wonderful plans. And we know uh, not just bringing them uh, to Bethlehem for this birth, this isn't the end of God using the Romans for his awesome, wonderful plan for Jesus and for the world. He has, he has plans and purposes, even if it makes no sense to any of us, even if we never know why he is doing certain things, we are simply uh, follow, once again, if it doesn't contradict what scripture says. Purpose number two, I believe, we get this, this bigger, more significant to us. We get fulfillment of prophecy. Once again, God is using the Romans to fulfill prophecy uh, that is hundreds of years old. Micah 5, 2 tells us that, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathath, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, who is coming forth from of old, from ancient of days. God has his wonderful, awesome, divine hand. He is bringing forth, fulfilling uh, prophecy, fulfilling all sorts of rich prophecy. This is what God does. He has a wonderful purpose, and not just let's make this young married couple, or not, sorry, young unmarried a pregnant couple, let's let them have a little bit more difficulty in their life. No, he has a wonderful, wonderful prophet, a prophecy, a wonderful purpose. It's Bethlehem, the city of David. So we have the Messiah coming to, to sit on the throne of David forever. And so part of the richness of uh, Joseph being the father, if it was he was from another clan, another area, uh, even though biologically would not be Jesus' father, when we have this census going out, it would not have worked. Jesus would have been born in a different town, a different city, different community. So we get God working all these wonderful things together in the richness of this story. But as we know, the discomfort of the long trek brings more discomfort, doesn't it? Things kind of, they snowball a little bit for them. There's no room at the end. Verse 6 tells us, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, that is Mary. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. We know this very well. They are in Bethlehem. Mary goes into labor per God's divine plan. And she gives birth to her first of, of many kids. Jesus is wrapped in these swaddling cloths, laid in the manger, this feed trough for animals, which I believe will come into play later for helping these shepherds to go identify, well, who is this kid? Who is this baby, this baby that these angels are going to tell us about, help us to find exactly this, this child? And why the feeding trough? Well, there wasn't enough room at the end. So they go to this uh, this. 
a manger scene, and most likely, I don't know, a cave or whatever, but certainly an unclean, filthy uh, environment for a child to be born. Come later tonight, 6 o'clock to candlelight service. We'll unpack this a little bit more. And so we have this young couple who've been obedient, as far as I can tell, as best as they can. Joseph, you know, reacting not necessarily negatively. Well, this isn't, I don't really get what's going on. I don't trust that this is Mary really got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. That doesn't really make sense. There's no basis for this. I'm going to divorce her and quiet, kind of try to do the right thing, be the, uh, the right thing the right way. Angel comes, all right, well, I believe you now. They, they go to the city of David, to Bethlehem. They're doing all the right things, and yet things get compounded. Things get a little more difficult. Joseph taking her up to the rightful spot to be counted in the city of David. But he's, we have here now Jesus, our King of kings, our Lord of lords, being born not where a king belongs kind of a story of his life, not the king that anybody expected, not the king that anybody necessarily wants. So it's interesting to kind of sit back. So we have God's sovereign hand. He's able to do these wonderful things, make these prophecies be fulfilled by the, the Romans, everything. And so since God can do great things for his people, I think it's worth asking a question, why not provide a simple room at the inn? God can make things happen. Has anybody been on travel and had seemingly, you know, miraculous things happen for them where uh, there was a place or here's a, a hotel or whatever? Like, God does awesome, pretty awesome things. And you know what? You and I, we're, we're nowhere near Mary or Jesus magnitude. And God takes care of us. So, you know, I think it's worth asking why not provide this room. You know, someone could have uh, left as they were entering. Uh, there could have been a clerical error. Maybe look down. Oh, looks like there was actually a spot here. Somebody could have even said, hey, well, you guys can stay with us. God could have placed it on the hearts or something. Hey, we'll come stay at our home. We overheard that there's, you got some need. Uh, these clearly would have been easier on a natural level uh, than, than all three, the, the number of the, the miracles. I mean, God parted the Red Sea for the entire nation of Israel to escape from Egypt. That's a pretty significant miracle. God making a way for his people. The sun stood still for Joshua and the Gibeonites, providing victory. We have Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego in the fiery furnace not getting burned up. Certainly a room at an inn is a pretty easy, not even a miracle necessarily, in my opinion. It, God can do all these things. But as we know, in our discomfort, in our lives, God is always up to something bigger. We can choose to be obedient and follow, or we can choose to get, allow our, our feathers to get ruffled and frustrated. God is up to something Bigger God is capable of doing anything that a perfect being can do. Uh, so when he doesn't act as we want in the timing that we think best, that God, we can rest assured that God is acting according to what is actually best for everybody. I think that's also important to keep in mind. What is the whole big picture God's putting together? Often liken it to, it would be nice to be able to drive through even Port Angeles not a big town. It'd be nice to be able to drive down First Street or Front Street without hitting any red lights, wouldn't it? There's not a lot of light. It would be relatively easier. You know, you go into Tacoma or Seattle. It'd be nice to be able to drive and not hit any red lights. But think of all the other people that have to be put out so that I can have all green lights in my trip. All those other people coming in from the side streets. So God has, he's got to, just like our, our cities pretty, you know, simply have to work this whole thing together. God is working together a grand, wonderful plan and Rachel tells, reminds me of this, it's not all about me. Sometimes it's not all about me. <laughs> so we're, it's not, what is God doing? And we don't even become aware of all this. So this purpose of the manger birth, I think there's multiple things going on. What is God trying to do here? I think there's some imagery, some symbolism going on here that we can glean from this. Imagery and symbolism, we have this Emmanuel, God with us, the King of kings, Lord of lords, enter this world with no worldly advantage. In fact, he's got worldly disadvantage. Looks like he's born to some poor country folk. I'm not sure if anybody can resonate with that. But because of God, because he is God, he's going to accomplish so much. He enters in great humility, great meagerness it's not the grand triumphal entry that he deserves that he ought to have we get this contrast one of the my commentators said this contrast between the proper rights of the messiah and his own town of david 
I mean, he had the Messiah coming to his town. Certainly, that there should be some fanfare, one would, one would uh, imagine, yet the very ordinary, very humble circumstances of his birth. Continue to say, whatever the reason, even in his birth, Jesus is excluded from the normal shelter others enjoy. We have Jesus' humanity and his humility. Jesus tells us in Luke 9 that foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And so in this, I don't sense there's any malice or anything. It's not that they've looked on these, this young couple and you guys don't deserve anything. There's no even sense of awareness of the innkeeper or anyone else there. But I believe it kind of, it sets this uh, symbolic tone for the nation of Israel. They're not ready, they're not desiring, they don't even recognize who Jesus is. He kind of passes them by, they uh, reject him, whether outright or um, without even realizing it. They don't know who he is, their hearts are just not there. But who does come to visit? These lowly shepherds who are prepared, who are ready, who are doing their job, who are doing their dirty, disgusting job, who actually ironically separates them from having unity with God in a sense in the temple until they can get themselves clean. They're the ones that God calls to come visit Jesus. These shepherds who watch the sacrificial lambs to meet the Lamb of God, who will take away the sins of the world, brings things full, full circle. We have this great symbolism here going on. We get Mary getting to experience more of God's hand welcoming the Son to the world. Just these wonderful, awesome things going on. And so as we look at the, the shepherds here, so these shepherds living these, these lives of discomfort. Sorry. It's a wonderful thing going on. We have these shepherds, these, as I said before, living lives of discomfort. Um, and an interesting observation, we have David, who was, a sh who was a shepherd, we know back a thousand years before Christ's birth, was the only one of his brothers who was doing the work, who was doing what he ought to do when Samuel came by with God's direction, looking for the next king of Israel. He was busy, he was active, God found him, God was able to reach and, and get that man who was ready to be the next king. These men were continuously, religiously unclean by their, their handling of these animals. Therefore, they would be continuously socially unclean and outcast by handling and keeping, keeping watch of these animals. They would always be these unclean, as I had mentioned. If they're selflessly working hard for others, and we have these, these shepherds in the same region keeping, flock, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Preparing, getting ready for Jesus. I said they were continuously unclean. They were the social outcast, continuously working hard for others, setting that wonderful example that we should have. We should have that, that Colossians 3 mindset, that Colossians 3 heart. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that it's from the Lord that you will receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. These are, they didn't have, obviously, Colossians. They just had, we're working for the Lord. I believe this was their heart, their mindset. I think that they were ready. They are open. They were accepting. They were willing. Or else God would have gone to other shepherds. They weren't the only shepherds here in this area, just the ones on that hilltop. God could have gotten anybody. But just a wonderful, wonderful occurrence, wonderful appearance. Bless you. And so as we continue on, they're there in the field. It says that the angel of the Lord appeared to them. It says that the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. The angel said, I bring to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born in this day a city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. They are busy. They are doing what they ought to be. And they get this wonderful, wonderful appearance from God. The angel of the Lord shines brightly. The Lord uh, glory, his brightness, his splendor, his Shekinah glory, this physical manifestation of God's awesomeness appears right there in front of them. And they react with fear as all of us would, as Mary did, as Joseph did, as Zechariah did, this being face to face with God's messengers, God's powerful conduits and messengers. 
and he tells them not to fear. But the angel does. He says, why? He says, I'm bringing you good news of great joy. This wonderful Apparently got all Italian on there, and I thought it was sounding a little bit low. It's better and safer to my back pocket, keep me away from myself and my own worst enemies. So it's wonderful they get Christ the Lord, the anointed Messiah, the Savior of the world, get this wonderful, awesome, good news for them. And he said, this is going to be a sign for you, pointing back to his specific birth. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. This is how you can know specifically which child it is, not just any child. It could be any child. Is this the right one? Is this the not, not the right one? They had no idea whether Mary knew or didn't know or didn't know what's going on, but they revealed this is the child. And then suddenly there's this great, says, uh, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. And peace on earth among those whom he is pleased. How wonderful. There's this excitement. I, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of years the angels have been waiting for this moment. Waiting for this time when Jesus is finally going to come to earth. He is finally going to start to bring restoration and unification between sinful, broken man and this world. Yes, God has brought those, those Passover lambs to uh, to, to be that representative until Jesus and his blood could be spilled. But now we get full restoration. We now finally have God with us again, something that hasn't really occurred since the garden those thousands of years earlier. Glory to God, I have on earth peace among whom, with whom he is well pleased. How awesome is that? We have peace with God we might not be in per peaceful circumstances. We might be in turmoil with cancer or uh, work strife or relational difficulties or world wars, all these other things. But we get peace with whom God is pleased. Peace with the creator of this world. It says that when the angels went away from them into heaven, the angels said to one another, or sorry, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem. And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So the shepherds turn around. They want to see, see this wonderful stuff that God has revealed to them. And verse 16 says that when they, they went with haste, that they quickly went there uh, to, to go find out what was going on. And they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger just as it was promised, just as it had occurred says that when they saw it, they made known the saying that has been told to them concerning the child. They told them everything the angels had spoken. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. They wondered if the other people in, this, in Bethlehem didn't know the prophecy, or not, sorry, not the prophecy. They didn't, uh, they didn't know all that Mary had been through and Joseph had been through and the angels had been through. They, uh, they didn't know all these things, but all of a sudden you have God and his angels coming What's going on here? Is God really coming? What, what wonderful things are about to occur? We can see here that, yes, they went to Mary and Joseph, but they told everybody the good news, as Debbie had mentioned this morning. May this Christmas time be a time where we share everybody these wonderful, wonderful things. And Mary, once again, what did she do? She treasured up all these things. She treasured all these things, these wonderful, awesome uh, pieces in her heart, pondering them. In her heart, what is God doing? Going over and over again in her mind. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. God was on the move. They got to be a part of it. They were living 
yes, tough, difficult lives, but they got to be a part of this awesome movement of what God is doing. They turned and, and run to return to their sheep. They got to see this fulfillment, and they returned back to their, their lives, praising and God. I'm sure it caused a little bit of a stir in that town. And so I want to take a moment to step back and look at the purpose of these shepherds' discomfort, their, the purpose of their difficult life. And I said some of us are, are, are in or have been in that Zechariah, Elizabeth discomfort situation where and we have this difficult trial, this difficult discomfort. We have no idea why it's happening, what's the resolution, what's God going to do, how is this being for his good. Other of us have, you know, maybe a little more difficult lifestyle. We kind of grind in day in, day out. We have these discomforts of our lives just to try to, to be obedient to him. And so what has the Lord done with these shepherds? They get to use them to, to raise these unblemished lambs required for Passover atonement, as we've said. This wonderful purpose of their day in, day out. So that way, that, so that others can be right with God. So that way others can have that restored relationship. These selfless lives purpose of the discomfort they can be an encouragement to mary how awesome is mary gets encouragement from elizabeth she gets encouragement from the angel and i'm sure from joseph and but now we got these shepherds coming encouraging her she's going to need all the encouragement she can get yes it's a wonderful day she's being given birth to her child but to be encouraged with the work the hand that god has done because it's been about well nine months since the angel joseph or angel gabriel visited her Perhaps three months since Joseph's encounter with this fresh uh, revelation of God. These shepherds, their discomfort, they get to be witnesses for this world. They get to be wonderful witnesses to this world. How awesome is that to what God has revealed? We're supposed to be those conduits revealing what God has done in and through us. And you know, oftentimes our testimony is more powerful uh, than the word of God, which, yes, is sharper than a two-edged sword. But when we're able to share the work that God is doing in our life, what God has done, it's really difficult to refute the, the actual testimonies of what God is doing in our lives. People will all argue all day long, uh, many people, you know, what, this, what the Bible says, it's authenticity, everything else, and we know it's true. And, yes, we speak the, the truth and love about Scripture, but when we tell God those stories of what he's doing, that rattles their faith. That rattles and sinks deep into the hearts of them what God is doing in our lives. And I believe one of the last purpose here, number four, it shows God's heart for us. By reaching these shepherds. We know this, but it's a wonderful reminder that God doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't just care about the socioeconomic elite. Well, if you're blessed financially and with good, uh, you know, an easy life, then, then God is happy with you. God is content with you. God uh, favors you or loves you more than another person. But rather, we know that, that God, we can see through the shepherds, God uh, loves and cares for those whose hearts are obedient to his. Independent of how uh, the chips fall in our lives, independent of how easy our life is or how well our bank account or retirement account is or isn't doing so we get to see God's heart. We get to be encouraged today. We get to have our, our heart, our faith reinvigorated about what God has done, what he wants to do through all of us, through a job that, that may or may not seem, or a calling that may or may not seem all that uh, kingdom-focused. We see how God has fit and worked all these things together, using those that aren't elite, but they're simply faithful. We can be encouraged by how God works in and through all these things. And so as we close, just a reminder that God does great things because of discomfort. We see that on this first Christmas. God does great, awesome, wonderful things because of great discomfort. So we can look at Mary and Joseph's trek, the fulfillment of the prophecy, bringing them towards, uh, towards these shepherds. We see the no room in the inn, the imagery and the symbolism of this Emmanuel, God with us. He is king of king, lords and lords but he enters into life humbly. We see the no room at the inn, allowing for the shepherds to find Jesus in the manger wrapped in swaddling cloths. We see these, these shepherds living lives of grace discomfort, religiously, socially unclean, but they remain faithful to God. 
independent of what God said or what the people said. In the end, their obedience was blessed. They got to see the newborn king. They got to encourage Mary and Joseph. They got to point others uh, towards God. So as we wrap up this message, my encouragement to you is that, is that we be obedient, we be faithful wherever God has given us, knowing that the discomforts in this life, he's doing something uh, bigger, greater, more uh, wonderful. Yes, sometimes it's good to do a self-evaluation. Lord, is this difficulty uh, disciplinary? And even the discipline, he's using that for a restorative benefit. He doesn't just smack us down to beat us up, to be an abusive father. No, he's a loving father who brings discipline in because he wants to correct us to make us more like him. God does great things in our life, has and will continue to do, all for his glory. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your wonderful hand. We thank you that you love us. You have a calling. You have a purpose. We thank you that this first Christmas there were, yes, many discomforts, but there were many blessings going on. I pray that as many of us have difficulties, even this time of year is difficult. It is tough for many of us who have lost loved ones. Lord, may you be to us what we need. May you help us uh, to uh, lean into whatever discomfort, whatever trial, whatever difficulty that you have for us. Lord, may you continue to bless and anoint this day. May you draw us closer to you. May you open up doors and conversations uh, for us to be your witnesses. And may you have your wonderful hand on our service this evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So with that, have a Merry Christmas. Hope to see you guys back tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going to have a little bit different service. I got done in under an hour here. I think we can do it again tonight. What do you think, Kevin? I think we're good. I think we'll get it done at least by 9 o'clock tonight if we start at 6. No, it should be 45 minutes. You guys have a wonderful Christmas Eve. We'll see you back here uh, at 6 o'clock. we got some special stuff for the little ones, too.